angels are often placed at the top of a cross, particularly in Roman Catholic and Anglican churches. We who belong to the more Protestant tradition do not have that on our crosses in our churches. And of course we never have the dying form of a man hanging from the wood either. Because in our Protestant tradition we emphasize the fact that Jesus is no longer on the cross. That after he had breathed his last, he was taken off from there and buried. And then on the third day, he rose victoriously from the grave. But often when one looks carefully, you will see in a Catholic or Anglican church, the initials inscribed at the top of the cross, I-N-R-I. Does anybody know what that stands for? I had a Sunday school child the other day asking me if it's one of the names of Jesus. And I was so honored to help this youngster into a better understanding. Each one of those letters stands for a Latin word, I-N-R-I. -I. It stands for Iesus, my Latin's a bit rusty, but anyway, Iesus Nazarenus Rex Iadairum, which means Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. That particular sign was called a titulus in Latin. It's a name the Romans would give to the postcard carried in front of the person carrying his cross. It was to make the announcement far and wide to every passerby that if you mess with Rome, this is what happens. The Romans did not invent crucifixions. After all the empires of Old Testament times had come and gone, the Romans, just before the birth of Jesus, came to great power and influence. The army general Pompey marched onto Jerusalem in 63 BC and made that area a Roman colony. The Romans had other colonies also, and Persia was one of them. There where Iran is today once belonged to the Roman Empire of the ancient world. And that's where they learned the practice of crucifixion. They saw it there for the first time and thought, gosh, this looks like a wonderful way of getting rid of criminals. We think we are going to be making it our own. Thank you very much. For in Persia, it was the custom for a criminal to be crucified because it was believed that if he kept on walking on the soil, he would defile it. So the idea was for a criminal to be lifted off the earth so that he couldn't taint, uh, taint the ground. And so the Romans took this idea, made it their very own, and turned it into an art. Some of the historians who wrote at the time couldn't give us more horrific and cruel descriptions of what Roman crucifixions were like. It was a terrible, terrible way to die. The famous historian and statesman, the lawyer Cicero, who lived in the first century BC said, of crucifixions, that it is so awful that it must always be very far from the mind of any Roman citizen. Not only far from his mind, but far from his eyes and ears as well. Roman crucifixions were so terrible, they were not performed on Roman citizens themselves. And that is why we had the Apostle Paul beheaded 30 years after Jesus. 
He could not be crucified because of his faith, because he was a Roman citizen. Poor Peter, on the other hand, ended up being stapled to a Roman being. For Peter was not a Roman citizen. He had come from the same vicinity as Jesus. Upper Galilee probably had the same accent as Jesus as well. But poor Peter was crucified. And then we all know the legend that has survived to this day. That he apparently exclaimed, I'm not worthy to die in the same way as my Lord. And so they turned his cross upside down. Can you imagine anything more unsightly? The Romans didn't want to practice an easy kind of execution. For just killing a criminal by suspending him from a cross wasn't quite enough for those heartless, brutal army generals. They wanted more. They wanted more pain. They wanted more agony. They wanted more torture. And so they added to this whole crucifixion business two things that never had taken place in Persia. They added what we now simply call the flogging. The flogging became part and parcel of everyday crucifixions. The flogging was done with a whip called the cat with nine tails, because it would be a stick, and attached to it there would be nine strips of leather. And at the end of each of these strips, there would have been bits of lead and bone to maximize the torture, to make it as agonizing as possible for the criminal who had to pay a price. Crucifixions often happen to slaves, for instance, to the lowest of the low of society. It was not the pretty way to go, not least because it's condemned by the Old Testament. When Paul quotes in his letter to the Galatians in chapter 3 that cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree, he's referring to the Torah who gave that teaching. The flogging itself could be so bad, many a criminal succumbed underneath it, and that was enough to cause the average man to die. Later, a policy was implemented that the most lashes allowed to be given by the whipper would be 39, simply because as much as the Romans wanted the flogging to be painful, they actually didn't want that to be the cause of death for the criminal. They still wanted to go as far as the cross itself. And so I don't know who this intelligent person was who eventually came up with the 39 being the amount. There's no record of how many lashes Jesus received, but we can gather that he was so weak and vulnerable after all of that, that he couldn't carry the cross beam of his cross to the place of execution. He had been completely and utterly spent, not only by the flogging, but also having been sent from A to B to C during the night before being examined, interrogated, and investigated by people like Pontius Pilate and even Herod. In the smash hit musical, Jesus Christ Superstar, put together by Andrew Lloyd Webber, we actually do have Jesus receiving 39 lashes on stage, and it is beyond traumatic. To witness what could have been. We have it written that Jesus was so finished after however many lashes he had received 
that he stumbled underneath the weight of his cross, the horizontal beam, at least once. So much so that some kind of aid had to be acquired, that somebody had to be called upon to assist him on his death march. It was the custom of the day that a Roman soldier could tap you on the shoulder at any given moment, and when he gives an instruction, you had to obey, you had no choice. And on this fateful morning, the lot fell on Simon of Cyrene, a man from North Africa. Cyrene is nowadays in the country of Libya, for those who are interested. And it's quite something that somebody from our continent features so powerfully in the Good Friday story. Simon of Cyrene hadn't gone there to be part of any kind of strange spectacle. He was there for the Passover. He had probably saved up for years and years and years, if not an entire lifetime, to be present at the temple when that great annual festival took place. He was one of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pilgrims that had come from all over. All he wanted was a ceremonial Passover meal. He was either at the wrong place at the wrong time or at the right place at the right time. For his name has been left as a legacy for all posterity. He now features in the Synoptic Gospels. A Roman soldier must have, of course, tapped him on the sh mustn't get my soldier and shoulders mixed up. A Roman soldier tapped him on the shoulder and said to him, hey man, whoever you are, I've got a job for you. You better help this poor chap with his cross, otherwise you'll never make it to Golgotha. Not only had the Romans added the whole flogging scene to a crucifixion as part of the, 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 the proceedings, they also added this humiliating walk through the streets of whatever city the crucifixion was being performed in. So that as many people as possible could see that no one challenges Rome and survives. And so it looks like there was a 600 meter pathway that Jesus had to get through from where he had been tried and tested to the hill of Calvary. The hill of Calvary itself was an eerie place. I mean, the name says it all. Golgotha is the Hebrew. But it means exactly the same as Calvary. Calvary comes from the Latin calcis, which means head or skull. And there, there could have been more than one reason for why it was named that. The obvious uh, hypothesis that people have access to is that it looks like that hill could have been shaped in the form of some kind of skull. There's another theory, however, even more hard than the first one, believe it or not. The place of the skull could have been called that because it was a popular place for crucifixions and there's a chance that there could have been other skulls lying around on the ground from previous crucifixions. It would have been a very morbid, very somber place indeed. <coughs> After the flogging that the Son of God had to endure, there was also the humiliation. The games the soldiers played with him. And that makes Matthew chapter 27 verses 27 to 31 probably the most sad passage in all of the Bible. For there we see the sickness of humankind. Just how twisted we can become. For somebody thought it a good idea 
to plant a crown of thorns and to force it onto Jesus' head. Apparently, according to what Matthew writes there, they hit him again and again with a stick on his head, mocked him by finding somewhere a purple robe saying, you, you, you want to be a king? Let's pretend you are a king for a day. There's your crown. Here's your purple robe. Hail! All hail your majesty. As if that wasn't enough, these warped, warped people even ended up spitting in his face. Crucifixions were unsightly and ugly. For any given criminal, there would have been afforded five Roman soldiers to execute the, uh, the, the, execute the crucifixion and to make sure that the criminal goes through everything set aside for him for that day. <coughs> so if a criminal was on his way to the cross, he would be given the horizontal part of the cross. There's a Latin name for that, but I think my Latin is up for one day. So that would have been what? 45 kilograms? William Barclay, the New Testament commentator, tells us. So, so Jesus would have been taken on the Via Dolorosa, a 600 meter road, from the Praetorium, where he had been tried and tested, to the place of execution just outside the city and there would have been five so soldiers with him one walking in front holding the titulus the signboard saying in three languages Jesus of Nazareth King of the Jews the first soldier would be proudly in front wanting everybody to see the signpost Take on Rome, and there will be nothing left of you. Jesus would have been somewhere in the middle, and there would have been four soldiers with him. One here, one there, one behind him on the side, and one behind him on the side. Making absolutely sure that there's no chance of escaping. Not that he could. Not that he would. As they performed this death march with Jesus carrying the horizontal piece of the cross, that's allegedly where he stumbled. And they had to drag Simon of Cyrene in to help. They would have got to the place of the crucifixion, they would have stripped him of every piece of clothing which they later gambled for. They would have used 18 centimeter nails to staple him to that cross. And then they would religiously watch and watch and watch. We have some records of people taking days to die. <coughs> the crucifixion is not easy to parrot. And I sometimes wonder why God chose this way as a master plan for our salvation. Surely there could have been another way. This is God we're talking about. The wisest, the mightiest, the greatest. Wasn't there another innovation that he could have used that was available to him? Or, or how about this? How about waiting until the Roman Empire had fallen? With all the horrors of crucifixions and Barbaric games, 
gladiator stuff and all of that. It would be another 300 years only. Surely that wouldn't have made any difference to God. Shouldn't God have held on until the time of the electric chair? <laughs> or the time of the toxic injection they now give to serial killers and the like? Wouldn't that have been a, a more convenient way to do this? I just cannot. I cannot come to terms with God having insisted on this way as His master plan of salvation for the world. And I have frustrated myself over many years trying to understand and now I have finally reached the place of no longer trying to understand but just living in absolute unspeakable gratitude that I have ended up being forgiven and freed and saved and redeemed. Light and love and life have come to us because of God's intervention in Jesus. And perhaps we were never meant or made to understand. Perhaps we were intended to only trust. And so now when I come eyeball to eyeball with this instrument of death, I have given up trying to understand. I just say, thank you, Jesus. Purportedly, Jesus had been slain before the foundation of the world. Read John 17, read 1, 1 Peter 1. There's another passage, but I've forgotten it, but two will do, eh? I'm pretty sure that's all you can also cope with in one morning. In Isaiah 53, we have the forecasting. 600 years before Jesus walked on earth, we had the foretelling of what would happen to him, of how he would be led like a lamb to the slaughter. So this wasn't God's Last minute idea, let me just quickly send my son and see how it pans out. No, 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 no. From the minute the first humans fell in Genesis chapter 3, God saw the shadow of a cross forming on the furthest horizon. The world the world tragically seems to be moving on. I remember how few people came to our Good Friday services last year. I was shattered. It looks like a day that we want to avoid. It's just too sad. We don't want to do the blood and the war. It's just too much for us. The world seems to be moving on. I remember how devastated I was last year to be living in a holiday town and find out that the mall has normal trading hours on Good Friday, that our very own checkers here opposite the road trades on Good Friday from 8 to 8. And I'm not even a conservative person, but something inside of me just doesn't sit back over that. Yeah. Yeah. And so we will be here on Good Friday, either at 8 or at 10, and you will see on the little pamphlet that I've handed out to today that there will even be a closing of the day service at half past five, and I trust that people will turn up in great numbers so that we can end the day appropriately and with the integrity and respect it deserves. As far as I know, I'm the only pastor in the world who does an evening service on Good Friday. But I trust that you will be here with me to keep vigil at the foot of the cross. Isaiah prophesied that he would come and that he would earn the title of man of sorrows. <clears throat> It's all there. 
in the song of the suffering servant. I've been a minister for 19 years, but I've been preaching for 24. <coughs> and I suppose there's one line that has summarized two and a half decades of proclaiming the word of God. And the line comes from a song, a little ditty that my grandmother always used to hum. It goes like this. Because of my signs, it's not coming out so nicely. So let me just give you the words. There's room at the cross for you. And there's nothing that I want to be pronounced more clearly and more loudly and more powerfully this Easter, particularly this Good Friday. I want every person who sits in these narrow pews in front of me to know that there is room at the cross for them. And as the chorus goes, though millions have come, there is still room for one. There is room. At the cross for you. And I trust that as we visit this windswept hill called Calvary, that we will bring all our stuff and that we will find a wholeness in His wounds. I trust that as we journey through Holy Week, and that's another thing that people don't come to those services that lead up to Good Friday. I really trust that this year will be different. You will see I've got a full tenebrae service planned on the Thursday evening before Good Friday. I hope that we won't only sit the two and three but may now for hard money, but that people will come in great numbers to support the worship service. So as we approach Skulls Hill this Easter, that we will bring our stuff, that you will bring your pain and your unanswered prayers, that you will bring your regrets and your sense of rejection, that you will bring your suffering and your struggles, that you will bring your disappointments and your despair. That you will bring your obsessions and your addictions. That you will bring your tears and your turmoil. <clears throat> and that the crucified Christ, and that the risen Savior, will meet you there. There's a hymn that I don't often choose. In fact, I think I've chosen it once over 24 years of preaching, simply because I'm so scared that the people will sing it without meaning it. It's my absolute favorite. You know, if there's such a thing, now, I've got about 10 favorites. But this is my, my, my favorite favorite, okay? It's a hymn by George Matheson. It's called, O oh, Love That Will Not Let Me Go. George Matheson found out at the age of 21 that he was going blind. It threw him into a very real crisis. Even more so when his fiance left him because of his impending blindness. She just, she just couldn't continue with this thought that she would have to put up with a husband who couldn't see. He wrote that hymn at the occasion of his sister's wedding. His sister had been taking care of him and now, of course, was riding into the sunset with her new husband. And so he had to get the stranger to now look after him. He ended up, of course, never married. But he did find a profoundly meaningful relationship with Jesus. The one whose love would not let him go. 
I never choose that hymn because I'm so scared that we'll end up singing it casually and not in the sacred mood it was meant to be sung. Oh, love that wilt not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. The second verse starts with the word, words, O oh light that followest all my way. And every time I, I read or sing those words, I can't help but in my mind imagine somebody coming after me in my lostness with a lantern in his hand searching for me. The third verse starts with the words, wait for it. O oh, joy that seekest me through pain. I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace, I trace the rainbow through the rain and I feel the promise is not vain. And then as if he wanted to keep the best for last, George Matheson opens the last verse, the fourth verse, with these words, O oh, cross! That liftest up my head. I cannot dare to fly from thee. If you come to Jesus this Easter, you will get him as your very own Lord. You will get his Father to be your Father. And you will get his future to be your future. There's room at the cross for you this Good Friday. And, and although millions have come, there's still room for one. There's room at the cross for you. You know, the cross of Calvary means so much to me. I reflect on it often. And sometimes I see the dying Jesus hanging from these beams. And I see... I see the, 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 the drops of blood falling to the barren ground and then there where the blood drops fall, I, I imagine that flowers grow. And as his love seeps into your tired heart this Easter, I trust that there will be the forlorn soil that becomes fertile in your barren heart. And I trust that what Easter brings to you will be lots of beautiful, happy, life-giving flowers. Daisies. <coughs>